Greetings from panel four. <laughs> uh, hi, this is, uh, the, we're going to start now and we're going to start uh, our panel. Uh, let me introduce uh, starting, well, I guess I should start ladies first, right, Beth? Uh, right. My colleague uh, here at Pepperdine, some of yours uh, teach, what happens, we got a, a B in here? Sorry, it might be me turning off my phone. Sorry, I'm turning it off. Mine's off. <laughs> That's you? No. <laughs> okay. I don't want to have to get tough around here, guys, but uh, I will, you know. So let me introduce my colleague, uh, Babette Bullock, Associate Professor of Law here. She earned her uh, BA with distinction oh. from California State I University. I forgot about that. <laughs> and also has a PhD in economics um, and clerk for the Honorable Michael B. McKay of the U.S. District Court of the Southern District, <laughs> and my, my best friend on the faculty. So I, uh, I have a real vested interest, and uh, I'm glad that she is here to share this panel, and, uh, uh, and I'm sure we'll have great and wonderful things to say, as she always does. Uh, on my left, Brian Marler, the director of, uh, of uh, Houlihan Loki, uh, where he's a member of the Media and Telecom Group, and his experience includes valuing closely held and publicly traded business, and mostly more in the professional sports business. Right, Brian? Correct. Okay, and my colleague at ESPN, Andrew Brandt, uh, who does all of the uh, uh, business analysis uh, for uh, ESPN and is also the director of the Villanova Sports Law Institute. And we have traded appearances this year at each of our sports uh, symposium. I was fortunate enough about three weeks ago to go back and uh, be a member of his symposium in Villanova. And in return, he gets to, I, w I went to Philadelphia, and in return, he gets to come to Malibu. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> I made a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, uh, on the end is uh, uh, Mark Fainuwata, who's a reporter with ESPN, uh, most uh, noted for his book on Game of Shadows, a entitled Game of Shadows, in which uh, uh, he wrote the complete and inside story, if you will, of the Barry Bonds steroid uh, scandal. Um, uh, Mark's an incredibly good reporter and even a better writer. Um, and I consider him also, as I do all of these members of the panel, my friends. So thank you for being here. We're talking about what drives the machine. There's two parts of the college athletics machine. There's academics and there's uh, athletics. Um, so let's think about what drives the machine for a, mo for a moment. Is it academics or is it athletics, Bebe? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Roger. I like to call this the uh, Friends of Roger panel. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, apparently, uh, Mark, uh, you'll attest to this as well. When your friend Roger, he doesn't give you any clue whatsoever no, what none. the actual topic might be. Uh, so thanks for starting completely off topic. Absolutely. Uh, really well done. And uh, we will be friends for a really long time, I'm sure. Uh, so given that this panel is called Broadcast and uh, sort of the money of broadcast, that's a great question. Is it athletics or, or academics? Is that the question? So far. <laughs> <laughs> well, pretty broad question. Uh, so I'm going to put it down to an answer that I know, uh, which is that, that question comes up and has in the antitrust context uh, many times. And that's, we've heard it before about whether or not uh, the NC2A, um, to be cool, apparently that's what you call it. <laughs> NC2, if you're super cool, I'm not gonna go there. Uh, so the NC2A has um, been a lightning rod for antitrust suits uh, over time. In fact, much more so, though, so than any of the major leagues. Um, for example, since 1922, if you're counting the cases that have gone to judicial decision, NCAA has gone uh, before the court 31 times uh, out of a total of 83 when you're counting the other major leagues, MLB, NHL, uh, even throwing MLS in there. Uh, so definitely a lightning rod, uh, but amateurism has prevailed. Uh, amateurism out of those 31 cases, nine have been found outside of uh, antitrust. And why is that important? Because antitrust governs commercial activity. In other words, uh, whether athletics is, is really going to be this commercial activity or if it's amateur. And it comes out to say, no, it's amateur because the primary focus of the institutions is education. 
And that's a very strong distinction in the law as opposed to uh, professional leagues. For example, the NBA has only one purpose, and that is to pro provide a professional sport. So having academics and independent academics, uh, according to antitrust law, has prevailed as, as sort of the, the major focus of the institutions. In other words, the question would be, would Harvard exist without uh, Harvard Athletics? I think until this uh, particular March Madness, we didn't realize Harvard did have athletics. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, aside from that, uh, obviously uh, the answer is that it would be academics. Um, I know we've talked about it. Uh, there is a little uh, Methodist school here in Southern California uh, that came to great uh, power, however, through using athletics, of course, that is uh, the infamous Methodist school, the Southern California, uh, yeah, University of Southern California, USC, as we all know, uh, has really uh, sort of switched that paradigm, and it was really the Trojans that, that really brought them into focus. So there is a question for certain schools whether or not uh, the predominance of their athletics is what contributes to um, their academics. But vis-a-vis -vis antitrust law so far, we see a lot of emphasis on this amateur and the academic side. So I think that what you said, it's athletics, rather than academics. Is that in the show? No, I would say the reverse. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, right, Mark, but, is it, Mark Federata, is it time to pay the uh, student athletes? You know, it's funny, when I, I used to, when I first started, first of all, I, I actually just, there's one thing I need to do first. I, I just want to show of hands, how many either, how many non, either lawyers, law students, uh, or anybody affiliated with the law are in the room? Could somebody just raise their hand? There's like three maybe? Four, five. four or five, okay. Because I'm just going to get the crap kicked out of me today. I can just tell you, you know that as the, as the one non-lawyer, I think. Stay, you know. Good, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> I, when, I, when I first started covering sports, I, I was really vehement about this issue. That, that, uh, um, and I remember having arguments. Uh, the first, first job I had at a college was uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I covered women's basketball and, uh, and some, some football. And the University of Tennessee football is huge. I mean, it's just a, it's a religion in the, in the, in the state. And, uh, and people would talk, even then, you know, about the idea of should, should college athletes be paid. This is hardly a new concept. And I, I was always very sort of vehement about the notion that, uh, well, no, wait, they're getting a full education. I mean, they're getting four years of, of college. And, you know, when I went to a, uh, to a private school, Northwestern, where I paid a decent chunk of money to go to school, and that was a valuable education. These guys are getting four years, and so um, that's their pay. I, I since have, have come full circle, or not full circle, half circle on that, I guess, and, and, and I'm now at a point where after watching sort of the way the industry has evolved, and, and of course, you know, for my purposes, it's, this is an athletics question, it's not an academic question. It's, it's, I think that, as somebody said earlier, the horse has left the barn, and, and whether these are remain academic institutions, which they are, obviously, for the purposes of these discussions, and when you look at NCAA football and NCAA basketball, um, there's no question that these are billion dollar industries um, that are driven largely, frankly, by places like ESPN. Um, so I, I, I did a story semi-recently that involved actually the O'Bannon suit that has been talked about a lot. Actually, I, I think of it as the Keller suit, because actually before it was the O'Bannon suit, it was a suit brought by a guy named Sam Keller, who's a former Arizona State quarterback who ended up at Nebraska. And, uh, and O'Bannon then sort of jumped in and expanded that suit. But I, I sat with Keller at one point and played uh, an EA sports version of college football with him, NCAA football with him. And, and I sat down to play with him, and we pulled up the Nebraska team that he had played on. And sure enough, there was the quarterback for Nebraska looking exactly same number, same, same handedness. Even Sam had started wearing a black visor at Arizona State. He'd never worn one before at Nebraska. He'd never worn one at Arizona State. So EA had put a black visor on him. So the only thing that was not Sam Keller was there was no name on the back of the jersey because, of course, in the college games on EA, you can't do that, although you can actually get around it and download the names. But so Sam Keller's name and likeness and all of that were effectively being used, but, of course, Sam Keller was not benefiting from that in any way, shape, or form. So for me, that, that, that question is sort of moot. I, I do think there's all sorts of questions that, that arise around how you would actually make that happen. How do you go about the process of deciding to pay guys? Um, but I think um, 
you know, the idea of figuring out how to compensate and, and figuring out how to deal with <clears throat> the massive use of their likenesses to benefit the universities and to benefit the, the NCAA is, is something that needs to get addressed. Andrew, uh, the O'Bannon case, uh, the athletic director of Texas said that uh, if the O'Bannon case goes the wrong way, uh, the college football, college sports are over. Uh, he sees himself becoming a Division Three. University of Texas is going to become a Division mm -hmm. Three team uh, or a, a conference uh, and, and a Division Three conference. Do you think that's going to happen? <laughs> I think uh, college athletics is going to have to face some issues with litigation. Uh, whether that happens through settlement, whether that happens through depositions, whether it happens through discovery, it's going to have to face this issue. You know, my background is being an agent and working for an NFL team. And what, I always, what always just struck me every time that I recruited a player or that we brought in a player or that we scouted a player is that we really weren't noticing at all what he was doing as a student. Uh, that's important, but they have their own measurable for that in football. It's called a Wonderlook test. It really doesn't correlate to what you're doing in your studies at school. We commodify these players. So what's happened on this level, and again, we're talking about the highest level of college athletics, is that man hours, thousands of man hours, millions of dollars are put into scouting these players, looking under every rock, every nook and cranny to find the best players. How they do as a student, that's nice. It's nice to know they're good students. But that's a small, if not minuscule, part of the overall scouting process. So we have become where we've commodified these players. Now it comes to whether like an O'Bannon case or something like that actually puts that to the test. Where we're not really talking about academics versus athletics, we're talking about academics versus athletics slash money. I mean, if you're an athletic director at a university, I guess if you're looking at it in purely academic terms, you have 20 sports, you have 23 sports, you have all the women's sports, you have the non-revenue sports, and you have, if you're a big time school, basketball and football. If you're looking at it in terms of dollars, you're looking at basketball and football, and that's about it. Uh, I think the point that can be made on behalf of academia in NCA is that these schools do not just have football and basketball. So every school we talk about that has these issues where people are making so much money for the university, they also have 10, 12, 15, 20, 25 other sports that don't make that money. So again, when you start talking about O'Bannon, you bring in the corollary subject of paying athletes, which, again, we can figure it out. They're smart people. But think about the logistics involved in there and the people that do not produce a dime of revenue for the university. Should they get paid? Should a third string tackle get paid? Uh, should a star women's volleyball get paid even though they're losing money? Those kind of things would have to be factored into all of this. Beyond it all, of course, is litigation. And it's a long way off with the O'Bannon case. But I think that to, it's naive to say that college athletics at the level we're talking about is about academics. It's gone way beyond that. Uh, Brian, uh, I, I know your particular expertise is in professional sports, but in terms of, uh, in, in terms of, of college sports, in terms of financial, you know, broadcast rights uh, are causing incredible pressures on college sports. We're seeing realignments, we're seeing new conferences, uh, mostly because of a grab for the dollar. Uh, your comments on that? Yeah, and. Um just a little background on myself, you know, I do focus on uh, valuing professional sports franchises as well as regional sports networks in the context of transactions, um, you know, for tax planning, for ownership and whatnot. And we deal a lot with those regional sports networks and looking at the benefits of creating your own RSN or taking their media rights. And what do you do? Whether it's college sports or in professional sports. And, you know, there's a, a number of de decisions to be made. One is the trade-off, again, of what rights can I receive if I do a third-party television rights deal versus creating my own sports network. And if you're going to create your own network, well, am I still going to license, let's say, my Tier 1 and Tier 2 rights to an ESPN or a Fox to be broadcast, and then I'm only going to air, let's say, Tier 3 rights, which maybe aren't 
the best games or at the best times. And again, what kind of rights am I giving up versus what type of affiliate fees I could receive. So if you have your own sports network, effectively, you're going to have to develop the content or find a partner and do sort, some sort of joint venture that has the expertise to, to broadcast that network. And then you're going to have to go out to the various uh, MSOs and direct broadcast satellite operators, your Comcast, your DirecTV, and get carriage. And you're going to ask for so much per subscriber per month for those rights. And that operator, that MSO, is going to have to make the decision, do I want to carry you or not? So you look at the Pac-12 network. They've gotten a lot of carriage. They've done a, a great, great deal of getting that carriage. I'm a USC graduate. I have DirecTV. I can't watch those USC games because DirecTV hasn't entered into an agreement yet. Um, you know, you could argue that if you read some of the press and what's out there, DirecTV is thinking, well, do, do I need the Pac-12 network? Am I going to lose my subscribers if I don't carry the Pac-12 network? It's a trade-off there. Are they going to pay those affiliate fees or are they going to lose subscribers based on the popularity of that network? So you, you look at some conferences and they've actually have gone defunct because they've lost some of those teams. So you think about teams going to other conferences um, if a number of the top teams within that conference leave, well, do you have enough draw to keep your carriage with Comcast, Time Warner, DirecTV, whoever it may be? And that's a big issue there. Um, on the professional side, there's even more things to think about, and that's being uh, the revenue sharing situation. So if you're a Yes Network or a New England Sports Network, and now with the Dodgers New Deal, how much of that revenue potentially am I going to have to share with the other teams if I'm a top revenue producing team. And in terms of Major League Baseball, they're gonna make sure that if you own the Major League team as well as the network, that that's an arm's length transaction to make sure there is revenue sharing. And we've actually been involved in situations where we've gone in and done a market check on those rights fees to make sure they are at arm's length to make sure the revenue sharing is accurate. So a lot of opportunities there. You could say in the professional world, there's been a number of very successful regional sports networks, um, and, and in some cases, the RSN can be worth much more than the team, uh, but at the collegiate level, you just need to make sure, one, you have the draw, you can get the carriage, and either enter into a, into a joint venture or, or really have the operational expertise to, to make that a successful network. Andrew, we, uh, we work for a, a company that uh, <coughs> has changed the face of college athletics. Um, the, the amount of money that the ESPN uh, has brought to the table uh, has uh, had a great deal of influence uh, from starting, uh, from the number of games that are played to uh, starting times to uh, what nights they're played, etc. cetera. Um, I asked you earlier about time to pay players, and your answer was because of the enormous amount of money, and your answer was not so much that we shouldn't pay them, but it's a difficult formula to figure right. out whether to pay them am, or how to pay them. Am I right? Would you agree with me that it's time to pay them as opposed to it's difficult to figure out how to pay them? I'm going to give a typical uh, ESPN answer. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Wait, no one ever told me we're allowed to say that on the network. Yeah, I never get to no. say it. No one's allowed to say it. It may be the know. truth, I meant but I never get to say it. I, I'm conflicted because I think that you know, from a visceral sense in the economy of sports and the business of sports and the money they create, and I understand all the, seeing the jerseys in the bookstore, I get that. Um, but I'm conflicted because of A, what I talked about earlier, because we're, we're all talking about such a small slice of the athletic community in, in college. Just a tiny little sliver of who these players are that bring in all the money. And I'm also conflicted because, yes, I do have those ideals still in my head about student athletics and it's not about the money. Um, even though when everyone, <laughs> whenever anyone says it's not about the money, of course that means it's all about the money. Um, I think that if we take aside the big tickets, then we can come up with a model that these guys are paid and they are taken outside of the academic community. Now, that is a radical subject because obviously they're there to be students, but the question becomes, where, what are these guys brought to the university for? 
And what I can get concerned about when I see the sort of, like I say, the commodification of big time athletics in colleges, I get concerned is that early on, there are people being brought to universities that are not prepared to be there. And early on in their academic career, they realize their major is going to be eligibility. They're gonna take whatever they need to take to stay eligible, rather than taking what they need to go on to a career in something, to go on and study, to have a learning process throughout their time. So for that segment of the community, and it's probably more than we think, we should take them out of it. We should have an athletic community within the academic system. They're there for athletics. Because when you have these players moving to, early on in their careers, I've seen this, they move on to be, like I said, major in eligibility. What's the easiest course to take? What's the path to stay eligible? And, and then again, a final note, bringing it to the NFL. What happens with players that finish their college in November or December, it's over. They're not even, they don't even come back. So if they sign with agents, they're off to the agent place to start preparing for the combine. Then it's pro days, then it's the draft, then it's training for the, to get with their team. So by Thanksgiving, if they're not in bowl games, they're gone. It's a rare athlete that stays around as an NFL prospect. And they may have not only a semester left, but they may have years left to graduate. So for that community, again, it's not working. The, the, there's an academic model that's not part of their, their educational experience. So for that, again, I'm hedging, but for that group, I would take it out. For the rest of college athletes, they are, athlete, they are students, they are student athletes. Uh, Professor Bullock, uh, you and I have had conversations regarding this. Um, is it time for college athletes to be paid or is it, would you say that they already are being compensated? Um. Well, first I want to just play off of a little bit of what both um, Brian and Andrew said. I mean, it's an interesting concept because really when you look at the revenues that come in, the revenues are broadcast. When people say, where's the money for student athletics, what they're talking about are exactly what Brian talked about. It's the broadcast deals. And to be more precise, it's actually the telecast deals. Broadcast has a specific legal meaning, actually. And so it's these telecast contracts. And, and in those telecast contracts, it's really Division I men's basketball and football. That's where the complication comes in within the academic community that Andrew pointed out, uh, not the least of which is Title IX. And how do you deal with that? It's an interesting concept Andrew uh, presented. And I think with uh, Brian talking about the rise of RSNs, uh, regional sports networks, uh, arguably you could sort of uh, peel off uh, what exactly is the revenue portion of these Division I men's basketball and men's um, uh, football. But then how do you deal with the other academic um, uh, provisions such as Title IX and how do you distribute it? It does come, it becomes very complicated very quickly. Uh, but I do think it, it, it's, technically uh, possible. Um, as to the follow-up that uh, Roger was referring to, whether or not, uh, say, say again, whether, or not it's, uh, whether or not they are paid or they're already being paid. Well, there is an argument, obviously, that their scholarship money, as you, as you mentioned before, Mark, is that uh, the scholarship money is payment for it. Um, I, would, I would differentiate that there are different rights. Uh, for example, the post, uh, the post play video rights which came out in O'Bannon is an interesting case because it does seem not to be directly connected with the play uh, in, in uh, that the scholarship is paying for. Uh, so it does seem to uh, perhaps be a little bit more uh, unique property right that could be separated from that and so I, I will give you that. Um, also, in O'Bannon case has arisen uh, the archival tapes, who has the property rights to that. That has already been established in league play to belong to the team. So if we were to do that by analogy, maybe it goes to the institution. Again, we're just talking about historical playback. Uh, again, I think that's different than video, which is recreating the person. 
in, in putting them in, in situations that they weren't in. So I do think that's more an expansive property right that maybe should be individually negotiated. So putting that aside for a second, uh, the economics breaks down that actually scholarships um, or at least the opportunity to exercise a full scholarship whether you do so or not uh, is actually quite valuable. Um, uh, the different cases that, the different ways of allocating the broadcast revenues that have come forward in O'Banion uh, basically, uh, arguably, are less than the scholarship money. So if you were to have an either or, you get sort of the slice of the broadcast pie, or you get the scholarship, depending on your institution, you'd be better off taking the scholarship economically. Uh, so, so there is a valid argument that it is actually a very valuable consideration that you're being given. Uh, more important to speak to Andrew's point is not just the opportunity to finish the education, whether you exercise that or not, it's the opportunity to be in a position where you can be scouted. Uh, it's more efficient, and you know that. That's why you try and get to, into a team like a Notre Dame or someone else where you have high visibility or perhaps where, where you'll be played more. Uh, so again, that's an opportunity that you're being compensated for. So I do think we already have some compensation. Uh, uh, with the scholarship uh, that we shouldn't undervalue. Uh, but I do think there are a lot of other individual rights that seem to be uh, tossed into that that we could extract really easily and give to the player. Uh, Mark, uh, the enormous amount of money that, that college football gets, the teams that win the most um, are the ones that are the most on television, the ones that, that we know the most. Um, those really are because of the players. Um, I can't think of another financial model in which that kind of talent receives, doesn't have the ability to receive uh, remuneration or at least negotiate for remuneration. Uh, I want to keep coming back to it because I think it's, you know, personally I think it's time. Um, your thoughts? It's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I said earlier, I, I, I think that, that you know, in spite of all the sort of various complications about trying to figure out a method that something needs to change clearly. And I, I mean, I, you know, the idea that we're still, I know, again, as we know, I'm no lawyer. And, uh, and this, this, what I'm about to say, doesn't, isn't necessarily relevant when, when we're going to get into court. But the, the idea that we're even having a conversation anymore about amateurism is ludicrous to me. I mean, it's just like a, it's a you know, all we have to do is see the amount of money. I mean, I, we're not having conversations about volleyball. We're not having conversations about tennis or lacrosse. These are billion dollar industries funded largely by the networks. And, and uh, then the more they win, the more money they get, whether they're for winning BCS championships or for winning national championships. So the idea that like the conversation somehow still revolves around a question of amateurism for me and whether the NCAA can argue that, <clears throat> seems folly to me. I, I just don't even get it anymore. That when 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 people start making that argument to me, I, I just I have no no sort of like use for it because I just don't think it's it may be relevant for the law and that's obviously sort of where we're going to proceed. But I, but I think it's a it's a it's it's not a real argument in terms of the practical matter of what's happening in college sports right now. And so so to that point, while I agree, as I said at the onset, you know it's certainly valuable to get an education, obviously. Um, and there's a, there's a certain amount of money that, that's assigned to that, um, that's clearly not accommodating what's happening in sports. And I, I think the two things about that that are interesting, one, in one of the earlier panels today, somebody pointed out that, that yes, you're getting an education, but there's a cap to that, obviously. So, so there is no sort of free market in that. It's a, it's a, and and these, are, these are marketable commodities, clearly. So there's no free market in that. It's whatever the, whatever the, the, the tuition is, that's the cap. Um, but, but the other, the other piece of that too is, is, you know, and I think this was talked about in one of the earlier panels is, there's no, these, these are, the, these student athletes have two jobs basically, two full-time jobs. They have full-time, they have a full-time job as a, as a, as an athlete. I mean, I don't care what the limits are on practice times. If you talk to any college athlete and look at, you know, at the least the top levels, what they're doing, they're doing a full-time job by competing as athletes. It's just, there's no way around it. Between, between meetings, practices, 
travel, training, all of it, that is a 40 hour a week job easily. There's just no way around it. So the idea that somehow they're then supposed to be academic students as well, which any of us know who've gone to a, to a, to a school and tried to get through college or all that, despite how much we might have partied, know that it's, it's not exactly an easy task. So uh, I, I think clearly there's a compensation model that needs to come into play. But I, I, again, I, I have no idea what that is. I recognize the complications for it. But I, I just think we've left that, that, that question behind now. And the point is figuring out how to do it. And I, I don't know. I know that on the, on the issue of likenesses and that point, you know, one of the arguments from the, from the Keller lawsuit is that, Keller O'Bannon suit is that, you know, let's put, put aside a trust fund and we'll set up a trust and that some of that money will be allotted um, once, once kids are out of college and, and you, know, you, can, you can give them that money. But in terms of the current student athlete, how you set up the model, I don't know. But I think Andrew's idea of, of separating at least gets us closer to that. One thing about the time, just to chime in what Mark said about time, is one thing I noticed at the Packers when people came in from colleges is just the enormous amount of time they felt they had. Uh, and these are now saying it as pros versus when they were in college. They just, and that was a problem for us. When you give these guys too much time, that's obviously a problem. Money and time is not a good mix. Uh, but they would, I just hear people talk about, well, you know, so practice is done at, you know, two o'clock. What do I do now? Will you go home? You know, we'll see you tomorrow. Really? I mean, that's it? Because in college, you know, we did this, and we did training table, and we did that, and we, you know, it was just like, and, I, and none, in, none, none in that schedule was kind of study or classes. It was just this constant uh, requirement to be there. And the other th thought that I, continues to hit me, uh, both as an agent and a team guy, and Jeff knows this from being an agent, is just how sometimes so unprepared guys are with life skills. And this is, this is the really unfortunate part, because a lot of them don't you know, make the pros and have ability to, to make money. There's no safety net. Just simple tasks. And part of it is because they didn't apply themselves. But part of it is because there was some coddling going on by coaching staffs, by tutors, by all the resources in play for these top college programs. You know, I, I remember just telling a guy, okay, so you write a check to so-and-so. He's like, well, what's that? What, what's that mean, write a check? You know, 24 years old from a very established college. Had no idea what that was. And so this is, what, this is sort of beyond the study part of it. Because they are commodities, they're taken care of. And that can lead to negative consequences later. Haven't we, uh, hasn't the universities accepted that one with one and done? I mean, one and done, isn't one and done really saying, okay, come on by, stick around for a while, you don't have to be a student. Uh, you really, in fact, you can withdraw before anything happens to you and just play a little, in this case, basketball. So if that's the case, and, and, and as Mark says, I reject the, the word amateurism, aren't we really talking about professionals, uh, Professor Bullock? Well, in some ways, uh, my point was not to argue amateurism. That has legal significance when it comes to antitrust treatment and has and, and still has to be dealt with one, one way or the other. Uh, but my point is, no, they are being compensated, that we, which is what you would expect for some professional athletes who are just quibbling about money. Uh, so I do think that full scholarship is an acknowledgment by the universities that this is a commodification, that this is a, 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 a payment for, for play. Uh, so what your point is, is uh, and the cap that you brought up, uh, Mark, uh, is very interesting, is that basically I think your point is, is that you're not differentiating between skill levels of players? Was that your well, point? Well, yeah. And the cap is all equal pay, basically. Effectively, I mean, you're, you, you don't have an opportunity to make more than, than somebody else. Basically. Right, sort of like the, the draft choices. Right, you know, in your first couple years of, of rookie uh, years and other times that you're drafted in, uh, at least with one and done, you're allowing them to go to, to, into the, uh, the legal faster to recoup their money, if you will. Which I think, again, is an acknowledgement that it's a commodification in some ways. 
it's liberalizing the restraint on them. Um, I, you know, there are very unique issues between when you look at it, it legally from, are we talking about the NC2A or are we talking about individual institutions or conferences? And uh, you actually are going to get different legal treatment depending on what you're looking at. And I think what's going to be really interesting are the RSNs of conference play. Uh, and that's going to be a real interesting explain, development. Explain what an RSN uh, The regional sports networks are very fascinating because recently as we go from uh, pure broadcast now, those of you ordered over the age of uh, 25 or 30 understand what broadcast is. Uh, that's just NBC, CBS, uh, you know, our big networks. So those are broadcast free over the air with bunny ears, remember? Uh, but when we switched everything to digital and we have ESPN and we have satellite, we have DISH, uh, we have cable networks, and now we have internet, we have changed the telecast market tremendously. So our development of cable networks especially have gone exponential on regional sports nets networks. A network is often several channels on your dial, or it, it, to use the old language, remember what we had done? Uh, so several channels, so you literally, this is what my point to Andrew and uh, Brian, you literally could say Longhorn Network or, or, or Big 12 Network, and two of the actual channels will be dedicated to Division I basketball and Division I uh, you know, football. You could literally differentiate it if you needed to because the technology is now there. So it's possible to, to follow the revenue stream and attribute it. So it's becoming easier to do what they're suggesting than it has in the past. So I do think that's going to be an interesting explosion because the money that's associated with specific programs will become more and more identifiable, which makes the allocation problem much more uh, clear cut. Uh, so these arguments that we should allocate it according to the sport and revenue generation is going to become uh, uh, a bit more clear as we go along. And then, so sorry to interrupt, and I'm not an expert in paying for amateur sports at all, but do you also have any issues with parity among the different That's conferences if, if, if not everyone's going to make this, the same amount of money to play, then is everyone going to go to the bigger markets? Just think of Major League Baseball and the Yankees. Do they get the better players? And you lose the parity that maybe the NFL has because they share the media rights equally. And then you go back and say, well, if that wage is going to be equal across all colleges, can you really do that with small market universities that don't have the support, whether it be the, the, the ticket sales or the suites or whatever it may be? You, you already have that anyway. I mean, you have that inequality anyway, right? In the way the conferences are set up, and in within the, the conference, to expand, in the way they continue to expand, and, and right, and, 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 and within each conference. But then, if you're moving away conference to conference, no, do I mean, you get any issues there? But even That's there, you still have it, right? I mean, you've got you know, no one's comparing the the Southwest. Well, the Southwest conference doesn't exist. No one's comparing the, you know. Some I don't I won't even discourage just you know I won't rip on any conference. I won't right. comparing some bad conference to to the SEC or the ACC. I mean so. But I'm just saying, is there any difference in economics between the SEC, the Big 12, the Pac-12? That's going to where players are going to gravitate to one area, or it makes it more different for that university to to make that that pay scale compared to a different or a, a private university. Let's say in Notre Dame. Well, is this a good reason not to pay because there's all of these problems that uh, that they have to deal with? Universities getting incredible amounts of money from regional sports networks and other ways of broadcasting income. I mean, is is that an argument to say, well, it gets you know, it gets really complex and it gets really tough to figure this out, and therefore we shouldn't do it. Um, you know, it does get tough to figure this out. Is that a reason to say we shouldn't do it? I don't think it's a reason to say we shouldn't do it. I, I everything so I'm, I'm hearing is what 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 I cover sort of pro sports. I mean, wh what we're talking about here is developing a system almost like a collective bargaining system, but there's no union involved. Right. So we have a salary cap to try to encourage equality, to try and encourage level playing field for recruiting these guys. Uh, so we have some kind of, rest maybe you have to stay a couple of years instead of one and done. You put in all these things. 
And we seem to be headed towards the model that pro leagues have, which requires, of course, unionization to get a labor antitrust exemption. I'm sorry, labor exemption. So that's kind of just my thought here, is what we're doing is we're really coming up with a system. Again, logistics shouldn't be the reason you don't do it, but the system is going to look very much like a pro system. Uh, and I guess my final point is when you start talking about these things, I know athletics departments and universities have the same response, which is we can't afford it. We can't afford it. On the other hand, they afford the things they need to afford. Million dollar, multi, multi million dollar coaching staffs, multi, multi million dollar athletic facilities. So sometimes that excuse, if you will, does seem to fall on deaf ears when they're spending so much in other areas of athletics. You know, I should be a member of this panel rather than the moderator, but let me just put my, what I'm, I guess what I'm suggesting is. <laughs> Go for it. I guess what I'm suggesting is You want to switch? Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess what I'm suggesting is, is this, is that the model of, of college football changed when television came in. Mm -hmm. And that it, it, it changed from, you know, what I like to remember is the good old days, you know, uh, uh, how great it was. I mean, there was a time when not, there wasn't 100 games a weekend. Uh, until it was the game of the week. And you, that was, if your team was on, that was a big deal. But college football, uh, uh, television changed that. And I think what television did is, is make, is went from, make, make the universities go from an amateur, uh, or at least arguably an amateur uh, group of amateurs, to, no, to professionalism, and, and we ask the athletes to do so much more. Uh, the panel before us was talking about how it's a full-time job now. Um, 14 games uh, for many athletes, 14 games of football. Uh, summers, they used to give them the summers off. Now they have to train all summer. I think it's now, be, I guess what I, my argument is, is that it's no, we can't think of it as an amateur, and we have to think of it as professional. And if we do think of it as professional, why, why doesn't the free market reign here? And yes, I understand that means that maybe some teams will go out of business or Division Three will increase. Um, but what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? I don't think anything's wrong. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I think actually there's large agreement at the table about it. I think that just the question is how are you going to work it out? But I, I, and I think it is a, a question of sort of money distribution, as, as, as Professor said. I, I, it's not, you know, but of course all of this is a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful conversation to have. But of course the NCAA, at least at, apparently at, least at the point, this point has no interest whatsoever in that. So we're not going to make that call for them, clearly. Um, and, and so I, I, you know, again, I, I've said this from the start. I, I don't have any... I agree with you, Roger, and I, that's not often happening, I think, for us. But, but I agree with you, but I, I don't, and it being difficult is not a reason not to do it. Um, but I, I just, I, you know, the question's gonna be how is it gonna get implicated, who's gonna, or implemented, who's gonna implement it, who's gonna force it to be implemented? You know, you're, it's gonna require an acceptance that the model needs to change by, the, by NCAA presidents. And as much as we hear talk about the model needing to change, it's not like you see radical change happening. So I think there's, a, there's the sort of fantasy conversation we have about it happening and then the very pragmatic and real one, which is who actually is going to make it happen, who's going to force it to happen, and is it going to require, you know, unionization by players at the college level and, and, and that going to court and, and seeing where that happens? Is it going to, is it going to be the... the Keller O'Bannon case that changes the face of it? Is it going to be these concussion suits that are now looming for the NCAA? You know, I mean, to me, as a, as a reporter, selfishly, this is the best thing that's happening right now is the spate of litigation that's going on that the NCAA is having to face is not only fascinating, but it's fodder for change and, and all the things that sort of we, we hope for and that are interesting. You know, it's not so bad for legal analysts either. Yeah. I bet it's not. <laughs> and lawyers. And lawyers. <laughs> and lawyers. Um, uh, let me just think about a second. But, you know, what I've said to you... always picks on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the reason is, is because you and I have had conversations uh, about yeah. O'Bannon. Um, you believe, as I understand it, that, that it's compensation enough and that there, there really isn't a need for more. 
And, it, well, let me go ahead. Instead of saying what you say, you say what you say. <laughs> <laughs> For a change, let me let you say it. Yeah, 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 for a change. But, uh, so I'm going to completely ignore your question and answer my own. <laughs> what else is new? Yeah. Exactly. That's a good old professor uh, trick, because I wanted to pick up on uh, what both uh, Mark and, and Andrew said about uh, unionization. I find that fascinating. And the reason I find that fascinating is because when you look at the very old uh, uh, history of the NC2A, in its own proclamation, we heard from the NC2A, it has started out to protect the college athletes' health and welfare. If that doesn't sound like the goal of a players' union, I don't know what does, right? It has started out with that. The problem is, because of this mix with athletics and amateurism into the mix, uh, and then antitrust law that doesn't like broad associations. They like, you know, uh, well-organized, very clear, defined governance. Uh, they will treat that differently. That the NC2A, and many people talked about, suffers from sort of antitrust, la lightning rod things. Players' unions do not because players' unions enjoy, of course, the labor exemptions, you see? So it is fascinating to me to think about the, where the NC2A is strongest, where it wins against antitrust again and again, is when it is most clearly talking about player eligibility rights. Again, exactly the kind of things that you would find a players' union arguing in a collective bargaining agreement. <laughs> and that, to me, is a fascinating thing because would it not be better, perhaps the next move, like you said, Mark, of the NC2A is to actually be a union, to actually act more like a union, perhaps at a conference level rather than across the entire um, front. I don't know what it would look like, but then a lot of these problems would go away. Like you said, Andrews, then you could actually argue it. You're outside of sort of antitrust, arguably, uh, and have the CBA feel. Because CBA, of course, uh, protects players. So I do think it's a fascinating way to maybe restructure and be more effective protection for the, for the players. That could also cover sort of O'Banion issues, because of course they would deal with those directly and really ex ante figure out what the compensation was and the, the post-term uh, rights as CBAs do. So I do think it's a very fascinating proposal. You know, it's interesting you say that with the NCA because a lot of what we talk about in sports law is power of the commissioner and there's been great, you know, in the past year with the bounties, with the NBA stuff and the Chris Paul trade or non-trade, the commissioner power has been very much in the news. So when we talk about commissioner power in pro sports, now we drill down to college sports, we talk about the NCAA. In, in the study of the commissioner, the ideal, what we all hope the commissioner to be, is someone that looks out for the best interests of the game. What it has become is someone that looks out for the best interests of the owners, mm -hmm. which is much different than looking out for the best interests of the game in total and includes the players. Now you start talking about the NCAA. Are they looking out for the best interests of the players? Well, that's how they're designed but they, are they becoming someone that's associated with looking out for the best interests of the owners, which I guess would be the president's uh, schools, which may be antithetical to the best interests of the players, at least where it comes to this idea of business of college sports. So it's just a thought when you start talking about what the NCAA is designed to protect. One quick thought about what Mark said, because I think what he's trying to, what we're all trying to figure out is what's the inflection point? What is that tipping point that's going to take this to a pay-for-play model? And I don't know, but it's interesting. It's sort of happened at the conference level, right? So the Big East, the Big East of five months ago, had all these members. And over the past few years, there were all these thoughts about adding schools. And I heard a conversation where, you'll like this, Gabe, where Tulane was brought up. And the presidents are like, hey, Tulane's great. What an incredible academic institution. We'd love to have them. Then it gets to the coaches. They're like, no way, they stink. You know, we're football. They stink. We don't want Tulane. So then you figure out, what's the role here? What, what, what are these conferences designed to do? What are these schools designed to do? And now we saw the break-off. The break-off of schools that weren't beholden 
to football. The Marquettes and Villanovas and Georgetowns, et cetera, forming their own conference, which is now called the Big East. And so the conferences have done this. They have taken this point where Mark's talking about, now we see, can it happen with the players? It's much harder, but we'll see. The conferences are, what we're watching is the breakup of conferences. And the reason the conferences break up is financial reasons. Uh, is it reasonable to think that maybe five, 10 years from now, there's only going to be two conferences, one on the east and one on the west of all the best teams and they'll play each other? Wouldn't that solve all the problems? <laughs> <laughs> You're not talking much down there. Go ahead. I don't do college. <laughs> I walked in the wrong door. I mean, I'll take it if you want. Yeah, it's all yours. <laughs> I mean, that's the, you know, when you read all the pundits, that's what they say is going to happen, right? You're going to end up with, you know, two super conferences. And we almost ended up there, at least to some degree, when you looked at the, the Pac-10, now the Pac-12. But when you looked at the potential merger, um, with the the, uh, the, 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 the the Big 12. So, you know, and you were looking at like, a, I think if you look at the, the emails and documents that came out of that, that case, you were looking at a 2014 conference or something like that, and, and then discussion of the similar kind of thing on the East Coast. But I, I mean, I, you know, that consolidates the power obviously in ways, but I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I, granted, I don't totally track all of this, but um, I never saw that as a solution necessarily to sort of eliminating where we're at. You know, uh, I think, uh, it's interesting, I, I, I want to ask you this because I'm not tracking, you know, the, the idea, are you suggesting on the union point that the idea would be the NCAA itself would form, would, would become the union and, and would thus represent players? And then who would, and then the presidents would then be off on their own? Because when I talk about it, I'm talking about in the context of the players unionizing themselves right. uh, yeah, separately. Absolutely. Absolutely. From, because be the NCAA opinion. is the institutions right now. It's not, the, it's not mm -hmm. the athletes, whether it wants to say it is or not. So it, you're either, you'd either have to change exactly. and force the NCAA to address and become this athlete's or advocate or... Have a have collective bargaining agreement uh, by the union by the players themselves. And the players so would have totally their own. Separate. Union. Right. Absolutely, which, right. which deals with, uh, as Andrew said, you know, it's unclear what the, uh, what the direction is sometimes in the NCAA, especially on mm. issues like this with opinion. And then if you have a super conference, back to media rights, right. are those split on a national basis like the NFL? Right. Or does every school negotiate their own rights like mm -hmm. Major League Baseball? And again, back to parity. How does that affect the smaller market teams? versus large market teams, and then if you're paying those athletes, the larger market schools may have an advantage to draw the better players. But, but isn't that really what's happening now? I mean, isn't that, wouldn't, couldn't you argue that that's kind of a prelude? The, what, what we're, what's occurring now? What well, you just said, the, sort of the death throes of the Big East and the, the emergence yeah. of the new Big East. That all has to do with television money. Uh, that all has to do with the major source of revenue. And, and, and how do I get more? And so the event, you know, you could argue that, how do I get more? I get, I get better teams, and we all get in one league, and then I get some other, and we have a World Series at the end, or, or, or something well, like well, that. Well, sure, so but if, if you have a salary cap, though, and you're in a bigger market, you, you can pay more than a smaller market team. So again, does, does that take away from the parity? And maybe we don't have parity now, but you look at the NCAA tournament, and you still have those big upsets. If you're paying, and those smaller schools have to pay a let's say the lower end of the cap, how does that affect the competition base? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, the follow-up on the conferences, again, it's like Roger said, it's become a money grab. And what these conference schools have, it, what it is, it's a huge game of musical chairs, right? I mean, it's, these schools are just not wanting to be the last one without a chair. So, you know, Maryland records go to Big Ten and Pittsburgh and Syracuse to the ACC and just don't want to be left. You don't want to be left behind because the money's there and it's going to go away. In other words, the ESPNs of the world are not going to go after who's left. So we are heading towards these super conferences because that's where the money is. The question that, that drills down to what we're talking about is how does that affect the players? Well, the players are going to go to where the money is, even though they don't get the money, because it's the exposure of these big conferences. And again, we're back to the fundamental question of everybody making money off these players except themselves. Yeah, structure would be interesting. You can also think of it such as European soccer. 
and leagues, teams that get relegated. So could you have one conference, but you get rele relegated up or down to three or four different tiers based on how you perform? Don't know if it could ever happen, but if you're talking about a super conference, who's in it and who's, who's not, and if you're getting better, how do you move up into that conference? So if we're going to have a, if I'm going to jump right ahead. If we're going to have two super conferences, um, do you foresee a time when there's not going to be an NC2A? I don't know. <laughs> Ask me these questions. <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I know we're not supposed to say that at ESPN, but I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I think it, it's hard for me to imagine in the same way people keep talking about it. I'm immersed right now in football and concussions and the NFL and concussions and that whole issue is all I've been living for about a year now. And, and people ask all the time, well, when's, you know, is the future of this the death of the NFL? And, and to me, that concept is unfathomable. So in the same way, the concept the NCAA is going to go away seems an unfathomable thought to me. Um, you know, is it going to change dramatically? It would seem so. Although, again, I, you know, we're, we, in some ways, we're in the infancy of this as we see these very critical lawsuits now playing out over, of course, next, the next year or two years or three years. And I guess it's conceivable, you know, if the NCAA wins all these cases, what does change? Are we going to end up with a status quo? Or, uh, and, and, you know, people will still be arguing. Again, I mean, I had this conversation 30 years ago you know, with, with uh, colleagues about whether you should pay college athletes or not and, you know, whether, they, whether their tuition was enough. And so, I, I, you know, in that way, the conversation is exactly the same as it was. There's just more money at stake, and it's much more clear that the athletes are being exploited. So whether that means the NCAA goes away as an institution or not, it's hard for me to imagine. Um, but it's also hard for me to imagine, given the groundswell of understanding of what it is to be a college athlete now, um, and, and how much more litigation there is that seems to be at least getting some traction, that things don't change in some sort of dramatic way over time. Andrew? I think there will be change. Again, I, I agree with Mark. It's, it's hard to see um, that sea change we're talking about. Just like the football discussion about concussions take, you know, the death of football, I don't see that in any way, shape, or happening. Uh, and it's like, you know, we say these things all the time, like, <laughs> I see my kids playing soccer. Well, soccer's the sport of the future. Well, they were saying that 50 years ago. They are saying about 25 years ago. They are saying that 10 years ago because all the kids play soccer. Um, I think that college athletics is going to continue to build money-wise. So where is the tipping point? Is it going to be litigation? Is it going to be injuries? You know, again, the injuries suffered in Louisville the other day had such a national reaction. And just even me on Twitter, just so many questions from people who never thought about this. You know, what's the, what's the injury liability of Louisville? Not just now, but later. What if he's having complications with this compound fracture in 20 years? I never thought about it, right? And how many thousands of Kevin Wares are there that we don't focus on? So it's kind of these kind of talks that we're having right now. These awareness issues keep bubbling up to like, wow, you know, where, what's being done about these players? So the more of that is going to lead to more change. All right, now's a good time that I should ask and see if there's any, uh, in the earlier panels, uh, I was handed questions. I guess we don't even qualify for any questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, they'll do that. Anyway, uh, are there some questions? Yes. Well, um, go ahead and respond, and then I'll respond. Well, well, I think Andrew actually has touched on that a little bit by talking about the exposure, and I, and, and I have as well, is that part of what uh, 
I don't have to put my contracts hat on, so all you want else watch out. Uh, is that, you know, part of what we're talking about for compensation and payment is, of course, this is exposure being put on this national platform of celebrity and whether and that that is a potential to launch you. And the human being will do that at a lower wage in order to go to the next level. You are never more productive as a lawyer, for example, for all the law students out there, than in your second to fourth year. Uh, and then uh, you are underpaid. There's no question you are grotesquely underpaid for, for the value that you add. But we don't ask for equal uh, distribution of the income stream for the partners are receiving off of you to that. There's a leveling over time of the income. And so here, it's almost like you're paying for your internship, and that's why they get you a low rate. It's because a lot of people would like to have that exposure. And so arguably, you know, market forces are in some way there. They're limited by the NC2A. But they're kind of there in that, you know, you'll try to get to the place where you'll get the highest exposure, right? Because that's the, exactly the compensation you're looking for. So I do think it's kind of already in there in where high players will select to be, where that, those kind of compensations are highest. Because those non-tangibles, of course, uh, substitute for cash. Uh, so I do think it's kind of, we've already kind of talked about it a little bit, right? I would argue this, that everything you say is, is certainly correct, but I would argue that the reason that there are all the things uh, that you describe is so that the university can get um, players to come and play athletics um, in a model in which they don't have to pay them. And what they do is invest in capital investments, um, long-term investments like that, and trade those kinds of, of enticements to get better talent. Um, you're right. As there is a, you know, they do get that those kinds of things which you describe. I just don't think it's 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 uh, fair to equate, you know, long-term capital investments with the benefits uh, and the incredible amount of money that the university makes uh, with what the compensation is uh, for the athletes. It's just my opinion. Uh, yes, sir. All right, let me uh, read a question that's come to us. Uh, uh, if cable slash satellite provide providers ever go to an a la carte model and people who don't watch sports stop subsidizing those who do, what becomes of the leagues and conferences uh, if the money's not there? <laughs> well, for the, the RSNs that are carrying, let's say, the, the certain conferences, you know, that's typically more of a tier type model, not a, not a basic type model. So you're not gonna, even if it goes a la carte, again, we're talking about carriage, and is someone gonna pay a, a premium on their cable bill for that carriage? So, you know, there, there may not be a, a real big impact there, if it, because in some degree, it, it's already a la carte. Now, a lot of people, you know, have talked over and over again about the larger networks, uh, you talk about an ESPN, and if, if that goes a la carte, and what would be the effect there, um, 
the question is, would it ever become all a card? Don't know the answer there, but um, I'm sure there's a lot of lobbyists in Washington, D.C. They're going to try to prevent that as much as possible uh, across the board. And it's, it's not just the sports networks, it's other premium channels that are receiving premium affiliate fees. Um, so the, the question is, I, I don't know in the near term if we're really going to get to that a la carte type model. Uh, just to be clear, a la carte means that when you order your, your cable or your uh, antenna, uh, you have to order. When you order the basic package, you get all kinds of things that you may or may not be interested in. Most of the time, you're not. Uh, a la carte would mean you get to pick what you want, and you don't <clears> have to get all of these other ones that are bundled with it. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. One more question. I saw some hands. Yes, sir. Okay, I think this uh, ends our final panel. Thank to my panelists and thank you very much for coming. Professor Weston. Thank you, Roger, and this was a terrific panel. I want to thank all of the speakers who uh, participated today and Professor Larson, Professor Posak for doing double duty, the moderators, um, and also to the Law Review, Mike Wood. Congratulations, amazing job. We've learned a lot today, uh, as, as, as Kathy told us, we are the NCAA. Um, we are not all the BCS and we're not all in the big money, although we want to, to get there, don't we? Uh, we learned that television killed amateurism, but television is what drives the machine. Um, there are so many lessons that we've learned today and the discussion continues. So the future of college sports is exciting. Speaking of exciting, I, I want to announce um, the students in, um, my, my competitions, and as you go out, you'll see that we're working on developing the Sports and Entertainment Dispute Resolution Project here at Pepperdine. We have, I know Dan Boyson and Eli Malamud went to the final championship round at Fordham's NBA Basketball Negotiation Competition. We have Dan Parrott, Joe Franzi, David Mills, uh, who won the Sabre, the Society of American Baseball Research Analytics Competition. Uh, Amanda, we have uh, Amanda Fletcher, Carrie Ritchie, who participated in the Southwestern Negotiation Competition. <clears throat> we need to support our student athletes. We need to support our students. So I thank each of you for being here today, for taking the time um, and, and being with us all day and drive safely. And I think you'll be doing something tomorrow night. What will that be? <laughs> there, we got more basketball. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.